welcome to Raquel's Shop Talk with Greg Simpkins, Crayola, and Tony Sirenai. Um, sub. Oh, yeah. Sub. Is it sub D or just sub? Sub. Yeah. Sub. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. And I'm Natalia Fabia. I'm going to help ask questions and stuff. Um, okay. So one of the first things that we want to know, because, and both of you guys are just such amazing, talented painters, graffiti artists. How the heck did you guys meet? Or how did you know each other? I remember when we first met, you probably remember it too, in New yeah. York. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a show at, uh, at um, Joshua Liner Gallery in New York. And you came up and introduced yourself and said you were sub. And I was like, oh my gosh, like you're one of my favorite graffiti artists, <laughs> artists of all time. I started probably gushing like a big baby. Like I remember like, picking up old graffiti magazines and I was always looking at his stuff and Seth's stuff. And I was like, damn, this guy's at my art show. How sick is that? And you had Bill Plimpton with you. I remember. That's did, right. I was with Bill Plimpton. Plimpton. Cause you guys are from the animation background also. Yeah. Bill's a legendary um, independent animator from like when it wasn't, it was barely a thing. Right. So I know that when I talked to Bill about your work and, and I was familiar with your work for years because of you being Crayola. And that was um, the point in Crayola, meaning as your, your graffiti alias. Yeah. And it was about the time when pictures were really getting passed around a lot. And this is right at the cusp of when magazines started, like independent graffiti magazines were coming out. So there was all these people taking pictures of graffiti for years and compiling all these photos. And now they're like a little older and they're like, well, I can make a magazine and start like shopping it around. So I remember seeing your stuff and one being jealous of the name. And I was like, <laughs> oh, how did he, that's such a great name. And I like distinctly remember being jealous that you thought of that name and I didn't and the spelling <laughs> yeah. of it, you know? Yeah, but your name's Sub. It's like Sub and Subways. It goes hand in hand with graffiti. So it works. Mine's a kid's yeah. toy. And a toy isn't a good thing to be in the graffiti world. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very that good. is one of our questions is, Greg, are the crayons named after you? <laughs> oh, yeah, I wish. They are. <laughs> yes, they are. 100% I they think are. they've been around for a while. You're not that old. <laughs> No, I'm not that but one old. thing I remember when I saw your work um, being passed around in photos and everything, because I was in, I was, I grew up in New York and you were in LA. Uh, and when the photo exchanges were happening uh, across the country, I remember that there was a fair amount of character work. And I was like a character guy in, in that age when, you know, in the late 80s, well, early 90s, when you were kind of there, it's just like, difference between are you a letter guy or are you a character background guy I was I was both but yeah. I was definitely uh uh I was the background guy on a lot of of wall, walls because that's something I cared about that's kind of how I got into graffiti because people would come and bring their black books and I always drew so I would start drawing character so I just was and I grew up on 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 a lot of my influences were like cartoons and stuff like that illustration so I was instantly starting to do that um so when I saw your work you had a uh, character work so I instantly was like oh this is another character guy and especially you being on on the west coast there's a little bit of different style um and it was a style I liked a lot so um you know you instantly just stuck out to me so when I did see that you were showing at see I saw your your paintings though beforehand I I want to say I think I saw it down in Miami at one of the art oh, puzzles probably. first. Yeah, probably Basel. I right. was like, is that the same Crayola? Like, you know, and they're like, yeah, it's the same guy. I was like, oh, I did like, you know, graffiti is now you were doing canvases. And uh, right. so when you were showing in New York, I was very excited to kind of come across and co come come around and, and, and meet you. And also because I just thought your paintings were amazing. Oh, it was fun after that. Um, Tony invited me to go to Croatia with him and Sess and then a bunch of dudes from Europe for what was it called ecstatic like 2007 yeah. or something something it was the year my son was born my first son and we spray painted this giant wall out there I'm gonna put the picture up Pull that um it was really weird conditions to paint it on those scaffolding which were trippy and the kids are trying to still spray paint the whole time <laughs> yeah but the experience, give me spray, Mister. Give me spray. 
Yeah, give me spray the whole time. So we painted this wall out there, which was really big. It doesn't look as big as you might think it is. So it's like Cess, one, me and you. You did yeah. the character and your letters right there. And then the whole thing was just fun because we got to fly out there and stay together. We were roommates in this That's amazing right. like, like palace, it felt like. But it was, you know, a hotel. And then you just got to tour and meet all these amazing artists. Like Balin was out there from Spain. He won the whole competition, obviously. That, that guy yeah. is unstoppable. Well, it's weird that it was like a comp. It wasn't I know really it was like some sort of competition, but we were just out there painting. and Just for fun. And I was used to running around at the time because I kind of grew up. I grew up in New York, but I, I, I'm first generation. So I was always going to Europe. Uh, but when I got a little older, I was I was going to Europe on my own and I would go there to study. Actually, I was going there when I got a little bit well, more well known in the graffiti world to do graffiti stuff. But then I would go off on my own and go to go to the go to the, uh, the museums and I would go study old master paintings. So I would go do all this, you know, legal and illegal <laughs> stuff in, in Europe. But then I would take several days to myself and just go study old, old, old master paintings at the museums. And it was a pretty amazing way to spend part of your youth is like, you know, you're in New York city running around like a crazy person. Then you go to Europe, you do graffiti and all this skateboarding. And then I'd go check out old master stuff. So it was such a weird dichotomy of like, you're doing this and that they seem like opposites, but to me, they seem they're And even to this day, there's a similarity that is some people can't understand, but. Yeah. But now you're like, painting better than the old masters i like i i, I put you on a pedestal man i'm sorry but every time i look at your paintings i'm just like how the hell does he get those details and just like your brain like looks at light and shadow and color in such a great way and depth i'm like ah i finally had a bit of that i it's it's so wow. amazing like your compositions it's yeah well i have a question that's kind of similar to that somebody on i think instagram asked so tony you because you started out with graffiti and but you were always interested in traditional art and like you said being yeah. in Europe. So when did you start your schooling for that? And then also follow up. How did that your traditional painting education and work influence your graffiti and murals? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I was I I mean to be honest, I was always drawing and painting non graffiti stuff. It just happened to be like I grew up going to punk rock shows and skateboarding and that was part of the culture so it's something that was it's still near and dear I still love skateboarding I still love you know rock and roll and and that so it was a part of the whole culture so I was and I was an artist or wanted to be an artist so I would I, I drifted into it pretty pretty easily but I always cared about a lot of like how to draw and paint and I knew that when I would look at magazines or when I look at books when it was at the time, I was told that I should really like abstract art. And in a weird way, I thought it was almost punk rock to not. Like, okay. I was like, well, I'm gonna go do the thing that I think is cool. And to me, it was, it was kind of weird and outsider to be into like this beautiful old art. And so it just became interesting to me. And I just was curious about how to do it. Also, I started, you know, when I was watching the, you know, Bugs Bunnies and, and Tom and Jerry's and all the, you know, Disney movies and everything, you know, I'd get any information I could. And you would read that these, like the nine old men who were like the great animators at the time um, were studying with people who were studying with people and they were studying with people who came from like 19th century French academic painting or something like that. Um, and they were creating this whole new form of art in a very punk rock way. Like they just created art, this new form. So to me, I was always just like interested in this you do it because it's amazing and it's beautiful and you go into this, the, you go down the rabbit hole in so many ways. So, so I was always doing that. So even though um, you get a little older in the adventure, the insane, the insanity of, of graffiti and going out there and doing real graffiti, you know, going out there and doing the, you know, the, the illegal stuff at the time um, was so much fun for a young kind of wild kid that, um, I kept doing it, but I was starting to develop my taste in, in art. And I knew that I had to do this other thing. And also I went to art school and I was like, well, they were like, what do you want to study? And I was like, I didn't know what it was. 
Like I didn't know what fine art or anything was because I went to the fine art department and it didn't look like anything I wanted. So like, you need to go to the illustration department. So I went there and I was like, ah, because that's something I was familiar with because I grew up on, I remember seeing like Norman Rockwell paintings. I remember seeing JC Leindecker stuff. I just didn't know who his name, um, you know, Maxfield Parrish, all these like uh, uh, NC Wyeth, yeah. all these people, the golden age of illustration. So I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, not were necessarily- Were any artists in school too? Or were, was that kind of rare? There's so many, everybody was a graffiti artist. <laughs> I oh, went to okay. school of visual art, well, oh, you know, for college. Okay. Mm-hmm. And like, there was a ton of, of people who were like graffiti artists. Even people who were just like very, they knew about it. They did it the tiny bit. They didn't just, they didn't get deep and they didn't go as like, you know, as um, like my colleague, you know, my friends and I, and, and the people we looked up to. A lot of the New York writers, the old school, New York writers who were doing the trains and they were bombing and doing all, you know, like the stuff that to this day, I still just think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's awesome, you know? Um, So when I went to school, I I did illustration. Then I ended up um, working in animation for years and I ended up working for Disney and and MTV when in the early nineties first, and then Disney and developed a lot of the look of the nineties, like MTV era. That was a lot of me and some of my friends who were doing that kind of street looking stuff, you know? Um, but then when we, when I did the Disney stuff and worked on shows, it's funny because I've met so many people and sometimes they're more interested in like, like I worked on a show called Doug once, which was, I remember that. Yeah, yes. You know, I get that. I have people Daddy who are mayonnaise. like, I don't, yes. And people are like, I'm so not interested in your painting. All I want to talk about is Doug or, or the Tigger <laughs> movie or all these other concept art, the kind of conceptual art I was doing for some of the Disney stuff. And uh, honestly, in, in hindsight, it, it, was, it was an amazing um, introduction to like how to be prof- a professional. Because once I kind of left that and started restudying classical painting, I went into it with more of a like, I need to work really hard at this. And I knew what it was like to work hard and not be like lazy about stuff. So I ended up studying again with this artist called Jacob Collins and the, um, this amazing artist, Jacob Collins, a dear friend of mine, a fantastic teacher and artist um, in the late nineties, I believe. So I actually quit everything, quit movies, quit everything, TV shows. I was like, I just want to be a fine artist. Cause then I realized what I wanted, which is to be a fine artist and not necessarily work commercially. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the crossover. Like, I mean, I, I feel like we had so many similar, like, interests, especially with skateboarding, punk rock music and all that stuff growing up and graffiti. And yeah. also me, I'd sneak off and go to the Getty or stuff when my friends are out painting. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go up here and hang out. And I, I just remember a point in time where I, I cut off a lot of my friends I partied with just yeah. to get down and serious and just like, all right. I had an apartment that turned the whole thing into an art studio. I'm just going to work. I'm just going to make art. I'm just going to do this. And they'd be coming around the house. Hey, we're going to this punk show. I'm like, ah, I'm just going to paint. Like, what's wrong with you, man? You're not fun anymore. And I just buried my, yeah, nerd. I just dug in and just really pushed myself and just learned shit. I'd hang out with dudes. I just had tons and tons of books of artists, like my buddy Nato. He was like a, a art encyclopedia. He would take us, we'd go bombing we'd go, paint spots and yards and do big productions at night. And in the mornings, wake up, look at books, just go through. He had such a vast knowledge of artists and stuff. He's the one who got me into like line decker and all those guys. Mm-hmm. And he's like, check this shit out. And I was like, Oh man, how come I don't know about any of this stuff? I'm like, I'm going to art school and I'm not learning shit. Cause I wasn't going to class. I was at Long Beach state and I was basically <laughs> ditching class, hanging out with my now wife and just going to go surf like the Huntington cliffs on lunch breaks and then hurting myself. And just, I never went to class. I, I got by cause I knew enough to get by and then I'd go spray paint shit all over town and then yeah. show up and pass my classes. So well, I was a bad I student, but I was very dedicated to art. So that's where I probably different. Cause I was just like, I was a little bit crazier back then, but I just only wanted to make art. And I didn't like the way they were doing it at school. Cause it was boring as hell. It was way yeah. more fun doing punk rock flyers and spray painting walls and just, you know, running around on the freeway and getting chased. That stuff was more fun back then. What, what, what's funny is that when you brought it up the way, the, the idea of the way we, we grew up, 
we grew up on completely different sides, you know, different coasts, but I did the and, version uh, of that. I think I'm, I, 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 I'm not, I might be a couple of years older than you, but like, I did the same thing, like almost verbatim outside of like going surfing <laughs> and going to the beach as much. But like we did the oh, same, skateboarding. we did flyers, we did record covers, you know, even like in middle school and, uh, you know, you do like back of jean jackets or like yep. stuff or Slayer stuff or something on the back of jean jackets. I was doing misfits on the back of jean jackets for people. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it's amazing that we have this, and I've, and I've found this in a lot of travel that I would meet people from completely different cultures. And we had this like weird similarity and it's, you find your, you find your people, you know? Right. And I know that when I, there's certain people I come across and, and Greg, I'm, I'm, and this was like instantly when we met with you and I is like, I knew this guy, this guy would be like, this guy would have been my friend like now, or if we met 15 years ago. For sure. Um, For sure. So I always thought that that was interesting, especially when you meet, artists that there is an understanding like when we were talking even before the cameras went on there are certain things you got you you all were talking about and I was like you didn't really need to explain I just knew what you were talking about I was like yeah totally I know I know what you're saying right and, and, and I think one of the things is that is really important is uh, uh, finding a community we're we're very isolated in in what we do by by just by default of what we do but I think when we're not, it's really nice to have this like, community of artists and people who kind of just get uh, get you without right. you having to like show explain too much. That's like I think like that's true, and it's like when we were younger, I, we broke off into crews, right? Like especially in the graffiti world, like I was in my my crews, I'm still in them. But now since I've chose this path of of work, I'm in my studio by myself all the time. And when I'm able to, to sneak out of here and go spray paint a wall, it's, I go and hang out with my crews. And it's mostly to re, reconnect and have that feeling again that I had when I was in my teens and just like, oh my gosh, in like in like 20s, whatever, like earlier when I was hanging out with those guys every day and we're just plotting and going running around, you get that sense of community like with people that are like-minded. And then I, I, it's just weird like looking at that now and then looking at this, which is so different sitting in here and just painting, but my mind was always going off into La La Land, even back then. They'd even tell you, oh yeah, you just get into a black book, and then you wouldn't see him for a couple of days, and you come back with a two-page <laughs> spreader, that you, like, what? I was like, ah, I just, I, I had to do a good job, you know? Let me see if I have any pictures of black books. Yeah, start yeah, talking. I gotta start putting up some pictures. Natalia- okay, While you guys look for pictures, I'm gonna ask another question. Sure. Right. Okay, and this is actually, speaking of, speaking of punk rock, from my husband asked this. Ooh. The from best. Jay, from Jay okay. Finley. Okay, for both of you guys, um, what point did you recognize your own skill level? You were just talking about that, but and begin to dedicate more time or full time to your craft. Oh, I have a good, quick good. answer. I'll try to make yeah. it fast, just because Jay asked it, and I know Jay, <laughs> Jay will know this guy. Um, so we had a family friend named Mark Vidal who always saw in me that I could do art pretty well. And I just had started my courses at El Camino junior college doing art classes. And I was going to be a veterinarian. So I was starting going in that direction, but I took this one art class. My teacher was like, Oh, you should be doing this. And then my buddy, Mark, who went by Earl Liberty, he was in the band circle jerks. Oh. I didn't know what that was growing up as a little kid. When I met him, I was like eight or nine, but of course I knew who that, who he was by the time I was, you know, 18 and starting college, but he was working at a baseball card company in San Diego. He said, Greg, in his big, deep voice, you're going to come down here and stay at my pad and draw up your street scenes. We're going to make pogs out of them. I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, I'm, I get paid for that. He's like, yeah. So I went and crashed down his couch for two weeks, drew street designs, and he made pogs out of it. And I got my first check for 10 grand, something around that. Wow. At 18, I'm like, dad, I'm switching majors. I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I can draw animals. I don't need to, I don't need to work on them or anything. So that was like the first instance. I'm like, Oh man, there's more to this than just me like running around and tagging on stuff. I can actually push myself and, you know, make a career out of it. So it was thanks to my good old buddy, Earl Liberty. I just call him Mark. So if Mark's listening. That's could, really could, cool. could I ask you a question, a follow-up to that, which was yeah. a great, great question, by the way. Um, what, what start what what was your uh, main influence like when you start when you got to that point where you kind of knew what you wanted to do 
-hmm. what was the thing that got like, okay, I'm going to make art now. What is that outside of, you know, you're just talking about the pogs, but like, oh, I really want to start making my, my I was art. never not making art. I was, I've been drawing since I was like four and I, it, there was never not a pencil in my hand or a marker in my hand. I'm sitting in class. I'm doodling. I'm coming home from school. I'm drawing in sketchbooks. I'm trying to what were emulate. you doodling? Like, okay, comic book characters, things in comic books, cartoons, definitely cartoons I was watching. Um, gosh, I remember I had an Usagi Yojimbo comic book, and I just found these little drawings. I redid the, the Samurai Rabbit, who was featured in a bunch of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff. I just started collecting randomly those comics. Uh, I would sneak Heavy Metal Magazine, which my mom and dad weren't allowed to know I had because they would <laughs> kill me. And I was trying to draw the stuff I saw in Heavy Metal Magazine. So... Stuff like that, you know, Simon Beasley, you know, yeah, Boris yeah, Vallejo, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Fantasy art. I was really into fantasy art. And, you know, until I, I found like the Pops Realists. And then we had like a Salvador Dali coffee table book, like a lot of families had. And I got into that, into the Surrealist through that, like Magritte and all that kind of shit too. So I just always had art around me. I was always drawing and, and coming up with ideas and drawing for my friends friends were having me draw them tattoos and all that stuff yeah i was like cool 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 that was my thing but will i ever be able to make a living out of this and i really like animals so it was kind of like always weighing what i was going to do but i the art just sucked me in I said now you're going to do this well i remember having a conversation with you and you were bringing up watership down by uh, oh Richard yeah adams and and c.s lewis is uh, the line of witch in a wardrobe the yep. whole like narnia thing Both and i know still. that you were like those are two very influential books that seem to me seems like it still uh not, not guides you but but i could see it still like that that beautiful imagery that i got as a kid when i look at your work i feel like it's almost it comes from this kind of place of wonderment, you know? Yeah, that stuff is absolutely still there. Like, even today, I, I, and I read a lot as a kid. And now it's like, uh, today I had to sit and I wrote like maybe five pages, just some weird story popped in my head, just something that I could relate to a painting. So I'll just sit and write storylines, ideas. But it all like, all these stories start as like a portal to some place. Think of Alice in Wonderland, Phantom Tollbooth, Narnia, like the hero's journey that happens once you enter this weird world from like your normal, you know, chaos of your own world. Like everything I read as a kid, stories like that have worked their way into my paintings. So yeah, I, I wouldn't you know, put any shade on that. I think Watership Down and, and C.S. Lewis and many other art like authors, just, you know, the whole Three Musketeers, all the Alexander Dumas stuff. I've read all that as a kid. I was reading a lot as a kid. So those books got in my head. And I, now I just listen to audio books that stuff while I work. Okay. I'm sorry, one more, one, just to follow up on that. Does the hero's journey still? That's probably what every journey. single one of my paintings has been about the last four. It's about years. the hero. Yeah. And it's this, the, the world, the outside I made is my version of Wonderland and Narnia and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm putting together groups of journeymen going out and, and getting into trouble and trying to, to find their way through the outside. So that's basically everything I've painted for the past ever, as long as my son's, yeah, almost 15 years. So wow. that's, that's great. Nice. I love it. Wait, now you have to answer, Tony. Yeah, your turn. Oh, so wait, uh, just so people who are just tuning in, what was the question again? Um, yeah, I was going to say it anyway. Um, at what point? did you recognize your own skill level and begin to dedicate more time to your craft? So um, I think- Could be recognition, the, anytime you got recognition yeah. or anything that you felt like this is my path. I would be lying if I said that, that really early on when I was able to draw stuff that other people couldn't draw, that it didn't fuel some sort of, I wanna do this and I wanna get that, that like dopamine drip you know, like thing back, you know, it felt really good for people to be like, that's amazing when you were like a really young kid. So I was able to do certain things very, very young that other people couldn't do. But most of the people I ever come across that are do great work have the same story. But I think once I knew that I wanted to be an artist and I always knew I did, but of course, when you're growing up, you're doing multiple things, you're exploring the world you know, as a kid and seeing what sticks and what doesn't to sort of make you, you. Um, but 
when I started really getting interest, well, concerned with wanting to be a good, good technically, because I started realizing that's something I needed to learn. Um, people would always say, and you know, now that I'm older, you know, when I meet people or lecture or something and people ask me questions like, uh, what inspires you? I was like, there's a lot of things that inspire you. Well, what do you do when you don't feel inspired? I go, I go to work. I go and go in my studio and I work. But um, I knew that in the beginning, I needed to, again, back to the old masters, there was a bar that was so high and it just dawned on me that I was like, that's what I need to sort of compare myself to. Not that I want to paint like them, not that I can paint like them. It, that, that's like an impossibility. But I just knew that here's a standard that I can at least check to. So I wanted to get good. And, and to be totally honest, um, you know, uh, I think hard work, a lot of dedication ended up being more important than I ever thought. You know, you think in the beginning, you just, you get really good at this thing technically, and then that's it, that you're, you're a great artist. And that's just not, that's just not it, unfortunately. You know, I know people, I've had students who were really, really talented and they didn't work that hard. And I've had students who were less talented, but worked their asses off. And those people got better than the ones who were really talented and didn't work hard. So once I knew that I was able to do something, I realized that I had to work harder at it because I, it just, I needed to dedicate my, my time to working hard. And once I figured that out, and I, I'm still figuring out. And to be honest, like even now, I'm only now getting to the point in my, as a, as in my, as an artist that I'm starting to like, maybe really not worry about technical stuff. Like I think it, it was so, I was so, I was so like into it that I just it kind of wrapped up my my work, and it maybe the last eight years, I started really distancing myself from being so concerned. I still want to make a good looking painting, but I started distancing myself with like, that's what it's all about to like, what, what am I trying to say? And I think that's something that I'm still figuring out. I have a long way to go. And I think we all do, but I think it's like, as you mature, you start realizing that I just, there's just so much that I need to figure out as a person and not as a technician. Does that make sense? There we go. Yeah. I'm putting some of your paintings up here just so people can see. Oh, thanks. Thank you. You have a you have a better grasp of oh, uh, love some this. of that. That's the, so that's something that I know at some point we're going to get into, and this is something I really, really want to get into. And uh, and honestly, Natalia, I really want to get your opinion, your 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 um your uh, uh, comments on this is. I'm sure a lot of people here want to get into process. Oh, I love that. I yes, know people are dying questions. for process here. And I can't wait to find out how you guys approach a painting from beginning to end. Mm. Not only conceptually, but like how you approach it. How do that you That is paint one it? of the questions. If you guys want to do ask that, uh, Montana Raven asked, uh, I think for Greg or we should, for you too, though, I'd like to know Crayola's process from start to finish, including reference photos. How does he put that all together? I'm right there with, the with, 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 from Tony. I want the same answer, <laughs> the same question. Okay. Are you, you want me to, okay. My start. So this is a great time where maybe you guys can show, show work too. If you okay. Want. I can't sit and scroll. Uh, scroll and talk is hard. Let yeah. Scrolling hard. and talking is hard. Actually, if you? there's somebody else who's there, like on, because who can scroll, let me see if I can even, actually, if somebody's there could scroll through some of your work because your work is just, I such a fan I'll go of show, You want to show painting, probably paintings then. Yeah. Yep, paintings. I have a folder there that says paintings. Um, so my starting process is always the same. It starts with my sketchbook and I will sketch, I have it with me all day at my usual focus times in the morning, having coffee, hanging out with the kids or at night after I'm done working. And I will draw any kind of imagery that's just dancing around in my brain. Maybe I'm thinking about a storyline or something. And I'll just start drawing characters as loose and just messy as possible. I, I never, ever try to put a really sharp sketch together in my sketchbooks because I want to have room to play with it later. And then later on, if I get into the studio, I'll, I'll take a bunch of pictures of it and of the different sketches. I'm like, oh, I want to expand on this. I want to do that. Or I want to throw this 
up into like a certain size canvas. And I will throw it in either Photoshop or Procreate and I will throw it the transparency. So it's like at, you know, 10% and I'll just start redrawing it and redrawing it and redrawing it. Say I have parrots in the piece and I've just sketched out my parrots. I'll start looking online for photos of parrots just to kind of guide me and where the patterns go, the proportions, what the, the coloring looks like. And I will look at them and I'll just try to incorporate it into my sketch and make them look more parody. So cool. And then once I finally get the full composition together, I will size it right. I'll either grid it, project it, or do a Sorol paper, you know, transfer paper transfer, mm -hmm. or a little yeah. bit of each and transfer it onto the canvas, which is usually toned with like a sienna or something. And you're and working I, in acrylic, right, Greg? I work only in acrylic. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's that. It just was what I transferred to from spray paint. It felt it dried fast like spray paint, so I just got used to it really fast. And Do I just people started. Have asked if um, you ever work in oil. So I have an oil setup, that. and I only used it two summers ago when I had a minute, and I started messing around with. I did two. I did a painting of a hornbill and a skull just to practice with it, and I liked it a lot. But then I had commissions and I was like, oh, I got to get back to work on these and knock them out. So I never really revisit my oil stuff. Mm -hmm. But maybe one day I just really enjoy like I, I'm still learning with the acrylics and it's like every painting I'm trying to teach myself something new and uh, it never gets old. It's always fun to learn and push myself with it. So oh, Crayola sign right Oh, uh, that's my wife. Yeah, that's her hand. She has that as her wedding ring Aww. under her wedding so ring. Cool. And I have that tattooed on my forearm. Love it. So when you're so when you're painting and you're because I, I worked in acrylic when I worked in animation, but I don't I don't remember it's been so long, but I don't remember ever being able to get to get it to look. I mean, it looks your paintings look like oil paint. How do you keep the paint wet? Because and just it, because there's so many. Uh, there's so much uh, 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 form painting that you're doing, which means that you're just you're you know, when you're painting the form you're going from light to dark and and how do you get it to sort of stay consistent and wet that it's not drying that it's not it's not you're not just doing wet paint on top of dry paint well, I, I am doing i'm not i'm not painting it all wet i want it to dry I, i'm i'm at even speeding up the dry time i'm 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 blow drying it are I, you I, doing transparent layers yes transparent layers and washes I, I i paint really messy at first to get my form down and the only thing I'm usually really trying to keep wet when I'm working on is backgrounds. And I use this mixture of uh, Nova color acrylic retarder and slow dry liquid a 50, 50. Mm -hmm. And I use that medium a lot on backgrounds and it works like a charm to keep things wet. And I'll how use a little bit it of keep it, it. How long oh, does it keep it open for? Maybe five, 10 minutes. Not as long as you would with an oil paint, but I don't know. <laughs> like but here's the thing. for me, that's a long time. And I don't know the difference. Wow. I don't know what it's like to do an oil painting like that because I don't do them and I never got used to them. I never really did them that way. So I'm not trying to make my paintings look like oil paintings. I'm just trying to make them look like how the paint is letting me use it, if that makes any sense. I'm not attempting to make an oil painting. I'm just trying to make it look like how I see it in my head. And so what is that on the screen right there? Those are pictures of fish and sharks and oh. parrots probably and eels and lemons just anything I'm going to be painting, I'll just pull pictures up so I can see what the highlights look like, how they react to light mm -hmm. and like, just want it to look right. You know, if there's little yeah. pores in the, in the, the white part on the lemon, I want to know that. I want to know how dark does that yellow, like little dots go and stuff like that. So what, I'll, I'll pull up stuff to look at. Well, what are when the, you're, when you're adding all these elements into the painting, um, obviously you have to conceptualize everything because nothing yeah. you're going to get on the internet or photo reference is going to be exactly what you want it to be. Oh, never. So, so are you doing a lot? So, Cause your, your paintings are pretty big, a lot of them. Yeah. So are you figuring it out on the canvas or are you doing a yeah. bunch of color studies and, and figuring out where the light is coming from and conceptualizing the form? So they all fit together. These days, I like to do color studies in Photoshop before. Really rough ones, too. I don't take too much time on it. I just want to know what colors are talking to what. So when I get to the canvas, I don't have to do too much guesswork. But I do leave a lot of things open for spontaneity in my paintings. So there is some guesswork. And I'll just get a white pencil out, white charcoal pencil, and just start drawing on the canvas. And, okay, I can put that there. And I know what these colors are doing over here. That's going to talk to that. And I just throw it in there. And by this point, it's it's... 
I can I can work out the the color scheme. But I usually try to work out a basic color scheme beforehand, and then kind of use it as a model to go by. But I got to be honest, I haven't done that every time, and I don't yeah. always do that. But for bigger pieces, I, I try to. Like this paint, I I wouldn't make a color comp of that. I would just start painting because I see it in my head. Oh, okay. So so you're working in layers. So you do an under you do your drawing. You transfer your drawing. Yep. Either using Sorel pa paper or you're doing like a um, you know, I know for my own paintings when I I do a lot of drawings and I transfer my drawings and I'll I'll just hit it the back of it uh, my 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 tracing paper or whatever I'm going to use charcoal. charcoal or even oil. I do oil transfers and we could talk nice. about that later. But um, but there's a certain amount, like, are you transferring everything? Because when I look at your paintings, there's so much in some of them going on that I'm like, is he trans, is he no. out all this drawing? No, or no, are you no. doing things like almost a la prima right on the canvas? Yeah, I won't, I won't transfer the whole thing. I'll dumb down the drawing for transfer just so I know. I, I'll draw a circle and write the word fish just because it's so I'll know it's going to go there. I want the composition down. And I'll do just the bare minimum amount of lines to transfer, or sometimes I only do transfer part, parts of it and just work my way from the background forward. So I'll transfer the furthest stuff back. I'll work a background out and then I'll, then I'll transfer on the background elements. And then I'll just, once I have like a basic relative form, I'll take the white pencil and start drawing on it and, and fine tuning things, especially if it's a big painting. And then I'll fix it, matte medium, and then come in and start painting and then I'll work out where the next things go. Sometimes I'll so just when you're, stages. When you're drawing in white pencil, are these, are you taking these, the idea of it or the drawing from your sketchbook or are you just, is this the first time no, you're it, drawing this element? Are you like, I don't know, I'm just going to figure it out as I go with the white pencil? Both. A lot of times it's already have the sketch on the, the composition sketch, my, my pre-sketch. And I know it's going to go in there. I just haven't drawn it on yet because I want to do this stuff behind it first. Because I'm, I'm always thinking in 3D, like there's things behind it. So I have to finish the whole thing. And I end up painting over big sections of finished work and people hate it. I hate that I do it, but I'm not going to change it because it's fun for me. And it's it's still, it's unfortunately, it's part of my process. I'll finish a whole section and then, oh, there goes those mountains. I'll paint right over them. And it drives me nuts, but I see it there and I have to paint it there or else the thing in front of it isn't going to really be real. And so then I'll draw it on, I'll paint it, and then I'll do the next section and I'll go with Actually, just That was a question. Where do you get your inspiration of the, some of the backgrounds? Uh, like the Photography. I like to look at, at just photos of nature. So if that- Any traditional paintings too? Sometimes- Oh yeah, I, I like the Hudson River School guys are awesome. Oh, I love the Hudson River School guys. But, you know, after time- Frederick I church. I, yeah, yeah, Freddie Church. I, I, and then I, all of them are amazing. Yeah, and then I, I, is it Thomas Cole, one of those guys too? Yeah, Thomas Cole is like the granddaddy of them. Pretty yeah, much. He, that he guy. came over from England, and really influenced. I mean, it really the the Hudson River School was re the real first like American art movement. Right. That was like the you know the one that really started. Like there was always painting and good painting going on but that was the one that was like that was really embraced here and it actually i mean it actually even helped oh. create kind of create <laughs> a lot of uh the country because people were seeing these great paintings they're like that's out west we need to go out west oh you can anyway see the drawing here oh yeah so you, you yeah. can see the oh, drawing right really, in there yeah. but that's not even the final characters aren't drawn in that yet that's the stuff that was drawn to that point and at the end, more stuff even goes in that wasn't even sketched in there yet. So, so a lot of it can be is spontaneous too. Yeah, I like I just because when I draw it small, you never see like on a bigger canvas what could actually fit in there. Like wow, now it's, I got all this space yeah. that I didn't have when I was just sketching. Wow, this thing needs to go in there because that's part of this other painting, and they can talk to each other and be part of the same world. I want to. I mean, that's like, it's just such a high wire act that. I mean, and it looks like it, it's, it's weird because when I look at your paintings, there is this, like we were saying, otherworldliness, obviously, you know, not only just because of the subject matter, but it looks just like it is a dreamlike state. And I'm, that's what, why I was so interested in knowing your process is like, do you handle it? Do you approach it in this 
like when you're dreaming, you just don't know where it's going to go. Like if right. you're dreaming, you say they randomly just sort of shifts. And I was wondering if you even kind of approach your painting with that same idea of just like, let it go where it has to go. Yeah, I have to. I, if, if the idea pops in my head while I'm on it, I'm like, ah, I, I have to add it. I, I can't not put it in there. Like this piece right here, the rabbit season piece, that letter with the rabbit at the bottom, he's, he has his hand on the letter. It says, go outside. And it's addressed to Ralph, who's my main character in all my paintings. It's like, wow, how did you have him in? Like I snuck my main character in the painting without him even being around just to tie those stories. But, you know, this was like, here's what's painted on the wall. What's over that wall? We'll go outside and find out. That was the whole message on this piece. But I don't, I don't know. Super nostalgic. It was very nostalgic. I this had to feel like an old cartoon. There's Jen. There's Jen. And Jessica. And Dabs and Milo. Yeah, and Dabs and Milo. <laughs> Those are amazing. So when you're um how long are you usually spending on one of those like a typical size piece? Oh gosh. I mean like on one of the eight or nine footers. Yeah. Months. And it's hard to nail it down. I never want to say the exact because it's always. I different. know it's impossible because there's so some paintings like the newest one I just did, Piper's Pass, has so many small different vignettes going on. It's the most complicated painting I've ever done in my entire life. Oh, watch this one. I animated this one. Here it goes. Here it goes. Oh wow! <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> You even wow. put the light in, you're like, yeah, yeah. The light on his face and everything. That's wow. Oh, I chopped that up into so many pieces to make just that little light on his face look right. Yeah, I was teaching myself After Effects, so I was like, all right, here's a fun project. Do you have any How NFTs? You... Yeah, I did one and I animated one of my paintings. I made a this bird blink, it might be in here someplace, but this one was going to be one of I just holding off a little bit longer. How do you have the time to teach yourself after effects? <laughs> I don't. I just force myself. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. It's, but I, when, when I used to work in video games, I used to work at Activision. on like Tony Hawk's oh, cool. Pro Skater and like all the Spider-Man games way back in the day. And yeah. I had the opportunity to dip in a lot of programs, get a very quick bare bones. So like when I revisit stuff, I kind of know the, the language. Okay, here's Piper's Pass. This is the one that the so most so complicated amazing. painting I've ever worked on. I've absolutely had so much fun on every bit of it. I've been teaching myself how to uh, 3D sculpt and Nomad sculpt. And I sculpted mm. that porcelain um, or ceratops to over there. You might, you'll, uh, over below the Cheshire cat. Yeah, I sculpted yeah, that yeah. in 3D and painted it in 3D and then posed it in augmented reality in the studio just to see where it would, how it would be posed best on the canvas. Just to give myself a funny little extra job that I didn't need to do, but I just said, screw it. This well, is fun. I want to teach myself something new. Well, I, 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 I have, I have a follow-up to that. Do you feel like, I mean, do you feel like it helped? Because in a way now you're almost, you're almost have a reference that is a little bit more, uh, concrete, uh, designed to exactly what you're, th it's as if, cause I paint, I paint from life. Right. And I set everything up in front of me. And if I, there's a, a fair amount of uh, stuff I make up, but most of the stuff I do, I set up and or I build or I'll make it and then I'll put it in the setup and then I'll paint it. Do you feel like it helped? Is it something that you think you might do in the future where you're like, I'm going to start building some of these uh, creatures to see what they would look like? Oh, absolutely. In a certain lighting situation. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like it was such a fun process and a practice. And now I can, who knows, one day I might output it as a toy because I'll have that file. And I, I just love the process and I've always loved every tool I could learn. And even in, in that painting, the piano, I built the piano out of foam core and I lit it in the backyard and, lit, and put different color lights on it just to see and get a good angle pose for it. So I'll make stuff too. Hold on. Somebody's knocking on the door. <laughs> I, you know, that's one thing I was going to ask him is because there's, there is a consistency that I'm wondering that is he setting things up? Is he getting sort of stunt doubles? I do do stunt doubles. There's actually yeah, yeah. A, a character in this piece too. See that little spider looking with a gold head and a porcelain body just above the piano? Yeah. We actually have a toy of that we built for the stop motion project we did. I'm scared of the movie. And so I'll That's look great. at him. Yeah, there he is. I even built him in 3D also just to yeah. have it. So, and then, you know, if I'm painting like a, like a, a beer bottle or a wine bottle, I'll set one up and I'll draw from that and use reference for the lighting and all that kind of stuff too. But, 
But then again, I can't find like a real armored seahorse anywhere to sit and pose for me and sit. I think still. that's some of the magic in your work though, that it is made up. Like you don't want, like I need, I'm kind of like Tony, I set everything up and I need to see it visually, but I'm so jealous of people who can invent. I mean, Tony, you could probably invent, I can't, but. Yeah, you both can, come on, stop it. I, I know Tony does, I've painted with yeah. him inventing yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think to have, I think it's necessary as even somebody who paints from life, I think the, uh, the invent, I mean, when you, again, if you want to reference the old masters again, they made up most of everything, you know, yeah. you look at it and it looks convincing, but they made up everything. And I think, you know, my years in animation and, and, you know, illustration and all the cartoon doodling I did so much of it was invented that I can't help, uh, uh, but do that. But it, honestly, it's weird that back to, the question we had before uh, is it's something that I'm actually more interested in now. Mm -hmm. Like it, in a weird way, I almost want to revisit. I want to go back Yeah. now that I think I can kind of paint that I want to go back to what started it. And I think a lot of that is invention, you know, and see yeah. if I can mix the two. And I think that's going to be, my new paintings, you know, and I'm, I'm really excited to do it. I just have to get, I just got to get past a few more commissions. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> right now it's been, it's been a little tough, but yeah, I mean, I've always been so curious about how you would just come up because, you know, when I look at your paintings, I'm just like, there's just, I, I, I don't know if you, but I, to me, it just feels like there's so much thought. Every element has to have, has this like a lot of thought in it. And it just, it, it, know, start, just curious. It, it all starts with those kernels of thoughts that go in the sketchbook. And it's like, how can I expand upon that initial thing? What can I add to it? And then just double down and just go, oh, wow, more space. Remember those other ideas from the sketchbook that fit with this idea. Let's put them together. So I've had I, background elements that is sit in a sketchbook for like seven years. And it's like, oh, I finally get to paint that. Like that windmill character in, the, in one of the earlier pieces. I'm like, well, finally, a windmill riding on a dinosaur can be in one of my paintings. <laughs> so, but it also seems like there's a consistency in thought, meaning it doesn't seem just random that it, it seems like there's a beginning and an end to, to the idea where it's like, yeah, this, this is happening and there's a reason for all this. So I'm wondering, you know, back to the beginning of, of when you started the idea of a painting, are you like, here's the idea without the elements yet, but this is the idea I want it to, I want it to be this, I want it to do this thing, like yeah. emotionally to somebody. Yeah, I, I definitely have like a beginning idea and it, it, it's hard to, like this last show, it, it was all based around that Piper's past speech, which was basically a take on the Pied Piper of Hamlin. And the my characters trying to safely usher these eggs over this treacherous pass and get from one side to the other and i'm like well how many stories can i work on off on that and how can it incorporate my other characters into that and then i just start you know going into a daydream in a weird state in my head and just start playing in the sandbox and putting things together and it it, it just the Hudson River like a, uh, Hudson River oh yeah there it is <laughs> with a, a horse, shark eggs right there and if you look at the castles in the background they're shark eggs oh, wow. with shark fetuses inside the oh, egg wow yeah 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 oh, so in insane. the background of the painting if you look there's the eggs and I can see a little on the lower left there's a, a con like a little drawing like the kind oh, yeah, of uh, the, yeah, sketch of the sketch of it yep oh that's so cool oh here's a question from um YouTube Greg um. Is there something you've been wanting to produce or paint that you just haven't gotten to yet? Every day, are yeah. you kidding? All the time, there's, I, there's more ideas than there's time. I've, I've never run out of ideas to paint. I don't really get, uh, get artist block because there's just so many sketchbooks, so many folders full of, okay, here's a painting start, here's a start for a painting, but I don't get a start on because just, there's no time. And I, I really want to move into just painting big giant pieces too, because I can, just you can really render them so much more and pack detail into characters and it's a uh, I don't know there's no not enough time <laughs> so great let's hear Tony's I'll hear Tony's whole story let's switch over to Tony's art and his uh, <laughs> we've seen my dumb stuff don't well, you see that 
<laughs> well, let me see. Let me let me let me see if I can jump in. You know, when we were talking about process, yep. um, I have a couple of like process things I could show you. Let me show you this one big one, and then maybe we can get into some painting. I might mine might be a little bit different uh, as far as uh, my presentation, just because, um, like I said, let me. I'm going to put this into preview, and I know it's going to be all jumbled up, but I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. Hold on. See if I could do this. Uh, preview or finder. I'm just going to mute myself for a second because the lawnmower guy's here. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so um, I, I, this is a painting. Like, I, can you see this? The the drawing of a. a yeah, it's like half. The painting of a drawing. Yeah. yeah. It's a, okay. Cool. Um, I got a really large commission from a collector and they saw this painting, which was, I, I had this idea, I do the same thing. I would, I would just draw stuff in sketchbooks, all random stuff, graffiti stuff, cartoon. I still draw a lot of cartoon stuff, but um, I was at the Museum of Natural History and I drew these and I, I thought it was kind of awesome. I love rhinos and everything. So um, I ripped it out of my notebook, taped it to a, 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 some wood I had in the studio. And I just painted it, you know? Um, from life and a collector saw this and he said, I want to commission you to do a big painting for me. I love rhinos. I saw that painting you did. I was like, oh, cool. Um, so we figured out what I had this idea of wanting to do a painting. Well, let me backtrack. He knew my other, the other side, the graffiti stuff. So he knew I did very, very large things. And he goes, what's the largest painting you've ever done? I was like, uh, are you talking about oil painting or like the other thing? And he goes, no oil paintings. I was like, you know, this big. And he goes, well, make me a, a, a big painting. And I just sort of threw out a number, what, 10 feet? And he goes, yeah, go ahead. And I was like, wow. So I had this idea and let me show you the, the thumbnail I, I did for him. Wow. Um, and this is actually, I, I met him through Joshua Liner. Uh, uh, you know, who, where we, we first met. It was Josh, Josh who in New York, uh, who, who sort of connected, connected us. So I did this really very quick thumbnail just to be like, I had this idea of wanting to do a painting of uh, unfinished canvas. And, and again, the collector was like, I really like rhinos. I would really love for you to do something with rhinos. And I wanted to do something surrealistic. Uh, I wanted to do something that had a presence in it, but I, you know, still kind of a still life thing. So I did this drawing and he, he loved it. And he goes, go for it. Take as much time as you want, make it yours. So what I ended up doing is, oops, sorry. Let me get back to this. Um, I ended up setting up this pretty crazy uh, setup. I built it. I did all these sketches and you could see me, you could kind of see the size of pain. This, I started this years and years ago but I built the whole set in my studio at the time. And I went and got all these elements. I like made stuff. I created things. I, I had this vision in my head and um, I made this huge setup and I did in, I'll, I'll show you the drawing that I did before I show you the painting. That was the drawing that I ended up doing of this painting. And I, you know, it was approved and everything. And, um, and the way I started it is that, I, I worked this from life and I, I did started this a relatively normal size and I would just keep blowing it up. So it was like closer to the 10, whatever, 10 feet by six feet or something that the, the canvas ended up doing. So I ended up doing this very technical drawing that took me a really long time. And so much of it, I was learning all those little things that I was doing for years and years and years of, of, of perspective drawings and, and working on my drawings and studying with, you know, at, at the, I went to this after um, Disney, I went to the thing called the Water Street Atelier where I studied with some of the, I mean, I was just right place at the right time, but it was like me and, and people might here might know it was like me and Edward Minoff and Kate Lehman and Travis Schlott and Michael Grimaldi, Jacob Collins. I mean, Sarah Lamb. I mean, the list of people that were all at this one place is just, you know, it's like the who's who of the people that I love and, and the type of work I do. So all that stuff was like, okay, all, it was like the wax on wax off and karate kid. It was like, you keep on training and training and training all of a sudden it's like, okay, let me see if I can do all this stuff that I've been trying to do for years and years. So I did this, I did the drawing and then I did a color study of the idea. And the idea again was I wanted to have this rhino 
a unfinished painting of a rhino and I started researching rhinos and I started going to the museums and like I started educating myself and I do this a lot with my paintings is I, I'm a research I research a lot so I started researching and rereading all the stuff started rereading on how endangered I never knew how endangered endangered they were um, so I started becoming sort of obsessive compulsive about learning as much as I can as I'm working on this painting so um, I started doing like color studies uh, and the, and I guess what I'm trying to get to is that I do a lot of prep work. So it's, it's different on a painting this big, I started doing value studies. So I started doing these small paintings to sort of set up my value. Like what is the light and the dark? Generally, that's the thing that makes, if, if there was ever a secret to painting, which there isn't, but if I would ever say, is there a secret to painting? It's value, how light and how dark something is next to something else. And that's really great painting is just how light and how dark something is whatever the color like whatever the hue is or the chroma which is the saturation of the color that can be adjusted but how light and how dark something is so i started doing started doing all this prep work um so and here's a like a, a bird's eye view of the setup at oh, the wow. time um i had this is my old studio in down in downtown in in manhattan and I had a loft, so I was able to go up there and sort of look at the setup to sort of get myself uh, to understand. Here's another shot of it. When I was working on the underpainting, so what I did is I did this drawing and I blew it up. And then I transferred the drawing and I have several different, different techniques of transferring, um, whether like we were talking, doing a charcoal transfer or oil transfer. This one I think was a charcoal transfer. And then I usually like ink it and black India ink, which is archival and it doesn't mix with paint. So you could do that to sort of set the drawing in that. In this case, I'm doing a, a brown underpainting to sort of set it up. I mean, it's very similar. You could see the, my value study, which was pretty small. Um, so this is the setup and like, this is, I still don't consider this my first layer. This is my under, underpainting. Um, so while, while, when I'm doing that, um, I also start doing all these like little, studies of every part of the painting. And, and honestly, I did so many, this is like studies of stuff I wouldn't even use. These were tiny little, little tiny little paintings. I would go to the Museum of Natural History and I had this little Peshad box that I would bring with me and they weirdly didn't bother me. So I'd be doing all these little oil paintings in the museum and nobody bothered me. So I was able to do it. I was doing like studies of rhino heads. These are smaller, again, smaller studies. And I would do study after study. And what I was trying to do is I was compiling all this information. So when it was time to go into the big painting, like, you know, here's the original drawing that I ripped out of my, my, my notebook that wow. actually got me the commission, you know, like you never know, but like, cause I did that painting, I was studying the, you know, um, the birds, like where the habitat of the rhino. Um, I'll show you some under, you know, when I, here's my underpainting, uh, but here's like me starting to starting to finish and putting my first and second and third layer. I work in layers. So I work pretty op opaquely, but I'll start working in opaque layers and then I'll start glazing later on. But I, I pretty much go opaque. You know, I don't, I don't like if I need to get from point A to B, I just go from point A to B. And then afterwards I start noodling later on to, you know, and it's funny because people are like, because I'm known for doing some really small paintings. And I was like, oh, this won't take me that long. I'll just use a bigger brush, but you end up just using the brushes, you know, um, and, and. Uh, and what are your brushes? Think. What brushes do you use? It's this uh, brand called Trickel. <laughs> the best brand. And, uh, best brand. Uh, uh, I love them dearly. And I know I'm going to grab some later on and hopefully maybe even, you know, if we have time allowing, uh, do some. Uh, look, well, let me show you, let me show you the. Um, Here's a couple more like close-ups. I mean, wow. you can see this is really close. And again, this is probably about life size because they had, the painting ended up being, you know, I think 10 feet, here's some more close-ups. But let me, let me show you the, the, like the finished painting uh, and then I can break it down. This was the ended up being the finished painting. And can you, can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. And that's 10 feet, 10 feet tall? about nine, I think nine wow. and a half or something like that. So you end up seeing that all those little studies that I was doing. And I, and I had studies for every part of this painting. I didn't want to show you everything, but like, you know, cause it, it informed me on all, and I was using the studies to put into the painting. 
So all my drawings that I was doing. Oh, Charles Bard book. The Charles Bard book, you know, all these little things, the idea of the painting. There's a sub piece. There is a sub piece right down here, if you could see oh, that. Oh, wow. Someone I even put asked that, if there's a Durer drawing in the background. There is the Durer drawing. So I, I use Durer's because oh. the way apparently the story is what Durer did is that somebody described what a rhinoceros was to him. That, you know, this was a story. I don't know if it was true, but they described it and he drew what the person who traveled to Africa described. Because I think they actually tried to take or they tried to, you know, I think they tried to like bring one to Europe and it died or something like that. And, and the boat cried over. You can even see over right over here, you can see the original sketch that I did on a thumbnail that sketch that got me the 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 other thing that I was like, I don't I actually did that with the print. I was like, I did it in front of him, front of him. He's like, Yeah, that's great, go for it. It's super so, inception. Yeah, to, it, yeah, it was totally that. But what, what's really interesting and incredibly sad about this, the painting is called Oblivion. Um, there's a dodo bird here. I, as I was starting to research this idea of the painting, um, I started realizing that this is a black rhino. This is a Western black rhino. It's a, um, and this is the, the white rhino over here on the canvas. And you can see that I, I made it so it was finished in here. And as you go towards the back, it's unfinished. Um, as I was researching this painting, this painting took me about, it was on and off for about two years because um, I had my first, my daughter at the time and the, and the collector was so kind as to just let me take as much time as I needed because I needed to learn how to be a, a dad. Um, but what was so sad about this is that as I was like, so the, the Western black rhino was in super endangered when I started this painting. Oh. By the time I finished the painting, it was extinct. Mm. So in the course of me doing this painting and being all of a sudden aware of what was going on, I saw the subject matter, it's gone, they're gone. And the white rhino at the time was right on the doorsteps of the extinction as well. I don't know if it still is incredibly in danger, but it didn't go quite as far as the Western black rhino, which is gone. And there was like a few left at the time when I started the painting, by the time I finished the painting, they were wiped out. So in a way, this painting means a lot to me because I saw something in real time happen as I was researching and, and not by accident, but just get it doing the thing I do, which is like care about maybe the subject matter, care about the painting and go into the rabbit hole, you know, that we all do as artists to try to do a, a good painting because I think, I think art matters, you know? And, and if anything, I think it matters a lot now because, you know, especially with the news that's going on. Yeah. Um, so, Someone asked if this is a stretched canvas or wood panel. It is. It's a stretched canvas. Yeah, this would be too heavy <laughs> to do on, on wood, but it was, uh, this is a stretched canvas. So one thing I wanted to sort of note is for me, as I was doing the, doing the painting, I saw that there was like a space down here that was just wasn't working. And, you know, if you go back to the original, uh, you know, you, I ended up doing so, but I felt that there's something not working here. So oh, I had wow. to like go back, go back into the painting and figure it out. And I ended up doing, redoing, you know, kind of re, re-figuring out this whole, this whole thing and refinding my perspectives. And, um, and uh, here, and uh, kind of re like, cause I thought um, compositionally, it didn't work quite as well, uh, but once I put this in, I felt like the it 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 settled my eye. This be, this was getting very busy down here with the rug, so when I put that in, I just feel like it broke it up enough, and it yeah. just gave it another cool element that I just feel like for me for my eye, it just made it um it made it much oops sorry, it made it much nicer um, visually for for my eye. It's beautiful. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, one of the ways. This is a more complicated way that I do process. I still do a la prima painting where I go right into the painting as well. Um, 
but you know, this is an example um, of how I, I did something a, a lot more, uh, a lot more technical, and and just and, and I'll just you show you. Did you stretch your own oh. panel? Some people were asking your own canvas. Some people. I are do asking, hey, that one. I didn't. That one was too big for me. That I didn't want to mess it up. So I had Simon. I believe Simon Liu in New York did did that one. Who's like the the best, you know, guy. So he did that, but I make, I, for, before that I was making my own canvases and everything. Um, now I just, you know, I use panels so much that I honestly, I just, I, I call Trakel. <laughs> I go, Hey, I need some, I need some good ca uh, panels. Can you send me some? And they're like, uh, of course, but I, do, let me, yeah. I'll show you, I'll show you one. Let me see if I can find something, uh, really quick. Um, I, I mean, this is also something, uh, you know, a lot of it is just this, uh, and let me share this really quick. Oops, wrong share, sorry. Uh-oh, what was that? <laughs> oh. Well, I'll have okay, you think so about something. People, a couple people have asked whenever you wanna get to this, uh, they really love your flawless surface. Mm -hmm. um, this one person said they've seen your work in person. They don't see a trace of brush strokes. Yeah. Um, they, yeah. How do you achieve your surf that surface? Um, well, a lot, a lot what, I, what I do also, there's a couple of things. Um, I, I, the surface itself, like I tend to work on pretty smooth surfaces, not super smooth, because I like a little bit of tooth, but I like it to be relatively smooth. And I'll like match up my brush that kind of fits my surface. So if it's a very small painting, like one of those that's like this big, I use very smooth. If it's bigger, I use a more a canvas with more tooth on it. Just it needs to grab the paint. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll try to match up my brush to the surface. So I'm not going to use like a big bristle brush on a very like very smooth surface. I'll use a, a, a brush that has a little bit, I like brushes that give a little resistance though. Like I know the, you know, the, the, the brush that we have over here, the, uh, where are they at? the crimson uh, tacklons, which, you know, that uh, I feel like these have like a perfect spring for me. Um, so that's, Ah, very good, very good. <laughs> Didn't you um, suggest that they make those? Those I got, I got my own Tony one, so. Yeah, I, I only have a couple more. On, on, but what I do is honestly, it's the way I paint. And, you know, I, I, just, I just stress the, the surface a little bit. It's not really the surface, it's the way you paint. Uh, I work in, so in a way, if I'm, if I put down a brush stroke, here's my brush stroke, I'll put the next brush stroke down. So it's kind of doing that, right? So this little area right here, they kind of micro mix. So I don't really blend. And I know a lot of people see really, um, I do sometimes, but a lot of what I do is just, I work in form. So I, on my palette, I'll have, I'll have my, my mixture and then I'll make a tiny bit lighter version of that. And then I put that down, then I'll make a tiny bit lighter version of that. And I'll put that down. So it ends up being this, you know, I know what we say a lot is like, if you're painting a round object, and at any point in this, if we even have time, I have another camera. I, we can, I can always just set up and we can do like a quick demo or something like that and paint. But what I do is that I, if you think of a disco ball, if I wanted to paint a sphere and you think of a disco ball, like every little plane on that is a different mixture. And I just very carefully put those down, hopefully. And then I might take a soft brush like one of the, you know, I've used like the Trek L mop or like the golden tacklons, which are so softer and I'll tap it just a little tapping and it'll just sort of smooth it all out. But what I try not to do is if I wanna go from a light to a medium, put down the light and the medium and then, and then blend it, I try to go light, a little bit, tiny bit darker, tiny bit darker, tiny bit darker, tiny bit darker until I get to the medium. So I, I, I paint, I paint the turn. Sense. I paint the turn and the form as opposed to putting a light and a medium and then squishing them together. That makes sense. That's like the most basic like way I could do without really showing it. <laughs> A lot of patience. Right. Next question. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, we do have another question. Uh, where did it go? 
Okay. Oh, um, wow. Stunning work, Tony and Greg. Do you have any advice on how to achieve good likeness using photo reference? I do oil portrait commissions using photo reference. I use a grid, but I still struggle, struggle with exact likeness. Both of you guys can answer that. <laughs> Natalia, I would love to get your opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a Natalia question. I mean, I always, I'll just quickly answer since this is about you guys. No, but, no, it's about you too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, it's all about measurements and shapes. If you have the correct, well, value, actually, as you were saying, number one, but the drawing needs to be right. So if your angles and your measurements are correct and your shapes are correct, it's just automatically going to look like the thing, the person that you are drawing. It's not in the details. It's in the big, big shapes. Um, the details are just extra. So yeah. that's my advice. <laughs> Well, one of the, one of the ways that I would kind of when I when somebody asked me that before and I, and this when I first heard this I was like that makes total sense. If you're uh, you know outside in a block away was a friend of yours or somebody who you know and you didn't see their eyelashes and the, their lips, just the shape of their head, their proportions, you know it's your friend. You don't have to see their eyelashes. You don't have to see the shape of their nostrils quite yet. You just know that the basic shape of their skull or whatever is instantly identifiable. And that's something when you're, um, the one thing about working from photographs that gets very tricky is that it's easy to be just, just copy the photograph. And you can't do that. Like a lot of times when people who work from portraits work from photographs who get a really great likeness is that they're doing a lot of drawing prior to the photograph so they're not overly um, influenced by the, the photograph because the photograph is just, it's such a moment in time and you're separated from the actual, uh, uh, from the actual subject matter that I think a little bit of structure and simplifying the shapes like you were saying is really helpful for getting those um, really basic, um, proportional shapes that really, really make up the likeness. It's not the eyelashes that make up the likeness. It's how far things are from each other and where they're placed. Okay, awesome. Um, here's a question for, I think both of you. Um, is corporate sponsorship a plus or a minus for a career? I could say easily, I wasn't even thinking about it at first, you know, like, I don't think it's necessary for a career, but I, just the, the relationship we've had with Trakel, especially that I've had with them for like 13 years, like started really small and organically and grew into something that's really been great. Um, it, it, like I couldn't be happier having this sponsorship and, you know, working with the paint company I do. I just like it's it, 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 if it happens organically and it doesn't feel fake or forced that it, like I, I wouldn't take a sponsorship from something I didn't believe in. That's for sure. And I've had people try to, you know, sponsor me for stuff. And it's like, nah, not feeling it. You know, even if it was going to be a good move for me, I just didn't do it. So like only if it makes sense and if the opportunity approaches, why not? Like look and at even the product, right? Yeah. Like the, the product is just, it, it's great. So that's, it, 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 you can't turn that down. I, I remember when I was first talking to Courtney about like sponsorships and stuff too, it was, uh, I was talking about the Bones Brigade and how they were a bunch of skateboarders who, they're artists who did tricks with a piece of wood. I'm like, artists are similar. We're just, or artists doing tricks with a piece of wood, but it's a paintbrush, not a skateboard. Like, why not like have a pro team? Why not, you know, have this, this group of people who are really good at what they do, you know, represent them in some way. It just, I always compare it to like the skateboarding industry. Yeah, totally. I think, I think it gets tricky. Um, and I agree completely with, with you and have a similar sentiment. Um, you know, with the, I have a pod, podcast, suggested donation podcast that I do with Edward Minoff. And we get approached all the time. And, and a lot of it is just like, well, I don't, one of it, you don't want to be sort of, um, well, now I got to do this thing you know, for somebody and that's okay for my, it's not going to be enough money. So why even bother? So if I'm going to take anything, it's going to be because I be, like, I like it. I believe I use it all the time. Yep. So with Trekel, let's just say that, that I would, that was just an instant. Yeah, of course. I love your brushes and looks like 
that 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 works you know that works and and um and i'm really glad to get you know nice brushes <laughs> that i could use for the thing i do you know yeah Awesome. Oh, wait, and we can quickly ask Greg. Yep. So um, I don't know where the question is now, but how did that happen that your dad, um, did they show Trakel how to like make the panels? Or yeah, my dad used to build my panels and I used to stretch them or then my, my buddy Graham Curran would stretch them when he was interning for me. And because I blasted my hands pretty bad, especially I stretched a 16 foot canvas once and I was just, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah, but tough. But then my dad, um, when Trakel wanted to start making panels and stuff, my dad said, well, here's the way I've learned how to do it. And he, you know, sort of did his research on how panels are made, looked at other panels and came up with a good process and, and took his process and showed them. And so it, it's just a really nice, like kind of respect thing. They, they throw his name on the back of the canvases and panels, like a what's up, George kind of thing. And um, yeah, oh, cool. that's pretty much how it happened. Just like, hey, look at my dad makes for me you know wait what your surface is are you is, is your are you painting on gesso or is it on canvas glued to panel? it's canvas wrapped panel with gesso okay. on the canvas so i i gesso the canvases after they're attached to the panel oh so you're putting raw canvas on and then putting gesso on top i was but now i order uh the giant ones i order uh already primed with gesso like everything's done and you can uh, just like any like on stretcher bars, you can take it off. Right now, I have to have that giant one taken off the eight foot, nine foot canvas, rolled up, and sent to Australia. So that's going to be a process. But we're having fine art movers do it. I'm not touching it. Yeah. So when they do that, do they restretch it? You're not sending the panel. You're just, they'll make a panel there. Yeah, make stretcher bars, and they're going to restretch it and frame it in Australia. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. It, it keeps down shipping costs. That's for sure. By a lot. <laughs> i'll be able to repurpose that, that panel too i'll probably just get it and have them stretch another one on top of it and just like go go to work when you were when you were prepping your own panels with the canvas how many uh how many layers of like how many layers of gesso would you put on gosh sometimes up to five i've done more i've done up to seven layers and it depends on how smooth i wanted to get you know like you said different size different amount of tooth and there's plenty of paintings you probably see if you look online that oh he didn't put enough gesso on like a smaller yeah. piece or something like that if i got all excited and wanted to start painting and sometimes like ah oh, screw it i'm just gonna paint on that wood that's all covered in tags and i'll just do that too i just are you are you sanding in between coats and then the yeah. last one you're kind of you finish it to the to exactly what you want it to be absolutely every time that's awesome so Very i got my cool. sand my power sander over here and then i have my hand sandpapers and i'm going with the power sander oh yeah wow is this sir it's a sturdy yeah. Oh, especially when I'm weathering, like on these newer paintings where there's like walls in it and they're all weathered graffiti, I'll paint it and I'll just sand through it and I'll paint it and really? I'll sand over it. And then I'll put matte medium to reseal everything down and lock the layer. It's like layer locks on Photoshop. So I'm like, oh, matte medium. Pff, okay. I can paint whatever I want. <laughs> and then sand it down Z. again. And then like I've scratched it with scribes and stuff just to make things look like an actual wall that's been tagged on and repainted a bunch of times. Natalia, are you, um, do you stretch your own stuff? Do you get it? No, I suck at that. I get everything <laughs> pre-made. <laughs> um, yeah, pre-made or I buy rolls of linen or I ask Trakel to make me specific sized panels. Yeah. Um, what, and sometimes they'll gesso it or I'll gesso it myself or add, um, sometimes I'll do, I'll add modeling paste mm. or do a oil primer, but um I'm not good at making stretching anything. I'm gonna start it's making tough. my nine-year-old prime my stuff. I I just over it. I'm gonna, I like to get stuff primed, but I'm gonna enslave my nine-year-old and make him do it. 15 that's, oh yeah, that's why I would we get. Have that's why we have go kids. down those rabbit holes of like you know. At one point, I was doing you know lead priming on mine and being very like super. Oh yeah, you told me for, Didn't you melt something down? No, that was probably in a movie. But I knew you were talking about doing lead primer before. Yeah, I'd probably melt down gold. I was using gold at one point. So gold oh, wow. leaf and gold, like gold. Nat Natalia, I have a question for you. Um, uh, uh, by the way, congratulations on- On being fat, thank you. Yeah. Oh, stop yeah. it, maybe number two. <laughs> yeah. Maybe number two. I have I'll a question. I'll you guys. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. How has that changed? Has it changed your, your technique or um, 
your mediums or anything now that oh like, are yeah you doing anything to, what do you, oh, what, I, what are you doing different um well the first time i was pregnant i i remember i got that's when i started using gloves and a air filter purifier it's like a really fancy air purifier so i'm i've continued to do that i never stopped that but now um and but i mean last time as well as this time i'm you know not using any cadmium paints cobalt um and just been what using, are you what are you switching like a cadmium red light what are you switching it with uh now? scarlet lake scarlet lake okay at least from the research i've done it says scarlet lake is not toxic i hope that's yeah. not how it is i mean whatever sounds dangerous It'll be fine. <laughs> they all come. People used to smoke and drink. Oopsie. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I mean a Scarlet Lake. It sounds like a lake full of blood. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are um, you changing your medium? Non, your yeah, no, yeah, non-toxic mediums right now. Um, the Sennelier Green for Oil stuff I've been using um, instead of any uh, gam any Gamsol or any thinners or you know they, the the non-toxic solvent gels and stuff like that. Um, and actually I, I like changing up my mediums because then it forces me to do something different and explore. So, so yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. That's so great. And I love, and I love, I, I mean, I don't think I nearly experiment. I mean, I do, cause I get into the, the chemistry a lot and I know I used to be a lot more into it. So I've gained a certain amount of knowledge, but I was really into experimenting and figuring out all the chemistry in it. And it was really fun, but it, Get, it got to the point where I was like, it's taking up too much time <laughs> that yeah. I just need to know what works, make it very sound. I'm very into like longevity and, and, yeah. and archivalness and everything. Um, but when I've talked to people who are in that it, conservators at museums and stuff, when I have the opportunity to hang out with them, like I'm just, you know, badgering them with questions and, stuff, <laughs> and it's pretty fascinating. Um, I mean, one of the things, honestly, that you can do to, you know, that to cut down on any sort of archivalness is work on panels. I know we all love canvases that are stretched and I still work on stretched canvases, but uh, you know, conservatives are like, you want to take out 80%, 90% of your problems worked on work on a stiff, on a, on a, mm. on a rigid surface, you know, yeah. uh, that helps. Because and I heard it's aluminum the movement. too, like all that will last longer than aluminum composite panels, die bond. Okay. Yeah. Those warp much less and water doesn't get through them as much. So um, they stay stiffer longer. Not that you can't bend them, but like they stay stiffer longer. They, they don't get quite as um, uh, uh, influenced by moisture in the air. Like, you know, but you can even, when you go to the museum and you see like a 16th century painting and it was done on a panel on wood, some of them are like, they look like they're painted like not that long ago. And then yeah. you'll see stuff from the 20th century that was done on canvas and it's just cracking and falling apart and everything. And you're wow. like, well, there you go. <laughs> and I mean, the fat overlay. The fat trucks overlay. are still around that he just painted on cardboard. So I know that was yeah. not that long ago, but, but I it's think, a different cardboard yeah. than, you know, the cardboard like boxes yeah. now. That's true. Yeah. But anything you can do, whether it's acrylic or paint or oil, I would suggest know a little bit about the, 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 the chemistry of the medium you choose and just do a couple of things just to make oh, sure yeah. it's around for your, like your grandchildren or something right. like that. Like it's, there's a few things you can do that will just make a huge difference. And like, why not, you know, just might as well just do this and then you, you should be good to go for a long time. Yeah. Great advice. Um, okay. Question for both of you, but mostly Greg, I think, or Mary Smith is asking, Greg, what, why do you tone your canvas with sepia tone before you begin the painting? And then, uh, Tony, what do you tone yours with if you do? I don't like a blaring white canvas to start. It just kind of screams at me like the, the highest. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm bright. No, I, I like more of a medium. I, I consider it more like a medium ground to start on. And probably some smart person in, back in my history <laughs> told me to do it. And I said, all right, I'll do that. And it just... It's made like starting the painting much easier than having a screaming white canvas looking at me. That's just a simple answer. I, Tony knows all the technical reasons. It goes back I want to hear Tony reason. This beginning. is better than mine. <laughs> it goes back to what he said in the beginning about value. You judge your values better, right? Yeah. Yes. Right. So here, uh, let me, I'm just going to share this really quick. Um, this is called, so I do like, remember, like before I showed you that brown underpainting? Mm hmm uh, this is what I do a lot of times. It's called an eboche. Can you see that? 
Yep. Uh, this is so oh, this yeah. is the under this is the underpainting of the you know the thing this is called a naboche which just generally means like it's a colored underpainting it's very washy like i go into it almost like you would a watercolor yeah. not quite as thin as watercolor but it's pretty thin and what you end up doing is that you know in oil painting you build up the lights you kind of you know so you kind of keep the 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 shadows and the darks relatively thin and you build up the lights. Um, and when you when I do an aboche, I kind of build up the lights because I go in so thin that I'm just like almost watercoloring over the thing. And what I'm kind of doing is staining it. So I'm just staining it. And my simplest way I can, I, I can sort of think, of, express it is that I from 10 feet away, I want it to look like the painting that I'm trying to go for. Mm -hmm. And you can do that, you know, hopefully you could do it in like just a day or two, a day. Like, so in a day, you're almost mapping the whole painting out. And the reason why outside of like, you have a beautiful surface to paint on is I wanted to show you this. This is something you probably all have seen on the internet. Uh, but this is the reason why I do things like that. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons, and let me share this with you really quickly. Um, have you, you've seen this, right? Yep. This whole thing. And, you know, for people who don't know what I'm getting at is, you know, what you're saying about the white canvas and how it can just throw off all your values because you're working at the extreme of one place, black being the other extreme. The difference in, you know, for you who know the answer, you know the answer, but like obviously A is darker, uh, darker than B and that's actually not the case. A and B are exactly the same value, meaning how dark and how light they are. And that's one of the reasons why you tone your canvas is that you would just automatically think like your eyes lie to you because it depends on everything is relative to what's ne next to it. A and B are the exact same color. And that's the reason why I will tone something either brown or doing a boche, which is that color painting is to not on my first layer to not have this confuse me. Mm -hmm. And that's like, so if you tone it, uh, at least to a medium or something, at least you could start judging things. And that's the thing is that I use, I, I could, you know, all of us could probably just stain it and just go right to painting and right to finish. And that's fine. And that totally works. I've even noticed in my own work that if I do an underpainting, like a wash, like a wipeout, which is a, you stain it and see, you know, the burn umber and then take out the lights and make some of the darks darker very simple. It's not exact. It's just a generalization. The thing I've noticed is that when I've done it a little bit more careful than I even allow myself, it, like it, the painting becomes easier to do because it's like, okay, like the values are in the ballpark. At least I'm not getting tricked as much in, oh, this, this is throwing off the whole painting because the whole painting is connected. It's like a spider web. If you pull, if one thing is completely off, it sort of pulls all the other stuff off in the same, like it, it, but if everything is in this relative place, not only like first with your drawing and then with your values, you can figure out the rest. Like you, it does, then it becomes just small adjustments. The thing you don't want to do is to be like, whoa, that's completely off. Um, so working on a white canvas could really just automatically set, throw off your eyes. That said, I know people who know that and they'll be like, I want the white canvas there because I want the, you know, and, and let's say oil painting, I want the paint, the light to go through the paint, hit the white canvas and come back out, out of my eyes so the painting becomes brighter. And that's like, but that's like playing 3D chess, you know, it's like you're thinking whoops, uh, many yeah, yeah. moves ahead and that's fine. But like, I always suggest tone your canvas. It makes everything much easier. It's hard enough. You don't want to make it harder. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd have a better answer. <laughs> yeah, sorry. My nerdness They're and geekiness. No way, man. My, my street cred is like going out the window. No, oh, I love your, 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 your knowledge, man. I wish I had as much as you. Oh, stop. I always, always learn stuff from you. You're not, you're, 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 you're not even, you know, you're, you're forgetting the fact that we just scrolled through like so many of your amazing paintings. And I'm not just saying that because you're on it. Like your paintings are extraordinary. And I look at your paintings. I'm in awe. So like, yeah, yeah. yeah. both of you guys, actually, yeah. I'm a big fan of yours too. Tell you. Yeah, me too. Oh, thank you guys. Um, okay. Let me ask a couple more questions since I think they said there's only a few minutes left or. Oh no. 20 okay. No demoing today, Greg. 
<laughs> Unless you want to demo in five minutes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, or I can't do anything uh, in five minutes. Uh. What's everyone's thoughts on self-portraits? Nobody wants to see my ugly mug. I'm fine. <laughs> are, are any, do you have any self-portraits, but it's like you in animal form or uh, character form, maybe? I've painted my son in many paintings. My oldest, mm -hmm. Isaac, he's been in a lot of my paintings. Just because The I other did. one, you're like, whatever. Yeah, for me, and now I know my other one. No, I have drawing. Yeah. I have plans for Everett. He's going to be okay. a superhero. But uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't draw myself. I want to. Maybe one day I'll do it. Maybe when it makes sense. I just, I don't like looking at my face as it is. So I don't want to paint it. Well, what's funny, I think with so much of our artwork, and I know this is going to be some artsy fartsy like response, but um, a we lot of our, art, they're, they're self they're self portraits, you know, like I would put in, you know, the painting I did with the gumball and the bird, I'm yep. the bird, you know, like I put myself as the bird. Uh, but as far as like, you know, the person who asked that is probably the traditional self portrait. I think they're really good to do. I, I think that you a cheap model, you know, if they're working from life, <laughs> it's a really cheap model. So you just put up a mirror. Mm -hmm. And just work on it. And you don't, you don't have to show anybody it. You just sit there and, and, you know, I say that for self portraits. I say that with still lifes, anything you could do to like study, you know, study the, the, the form in front of you, whether it's a still life, which is really great because it's cheap. It's anything, grab anything, set it up, paint it. Um, self portraits, great way to do, you know, the figure. Uh, and I also think it's, it's kind of, and I agree with you. I don't want to look at myself. I hate looking at myself actually, but like, I think it's a good thing. I, I have a self-portrait. I've done several, but I had one here that I thought was just interesting. And I had it in the more in the graffiti section, but this was like, I call this, I did this yeah, I a that. long oh, yeah. time ago, I know that one. I just, yeah, I know that but one. it's called the portrait of sub, which is my alias. Mm -hmm. And people would be like, well, how'd you do it from life? If it's a, uh, uh, if it's a uh, side profile. profile. And I, uh, and the way I did it is I set up two mirrors. So I had one mirror oh. here and one mirror here and you bounce it off and you can look and you can see your profile. Wow. So I did it like that. And that, the painting's only about that big, it's tiny. Oh, wow. But I did it about the size I saw it, which is a, was about that big. Um, and it was really interesting to do. And I thought it was interesting since I was looking at myself, conceptually I was looking at myself in, the, in a mirror that I just saw it as me as a totally different person. So I just did my alias. I just did a, so I, I, I approach it as like, I'm doing a portrait of this, this person I know really well, mm -hmm. who's this graffiti guy who loves graffiti and was this total other person. So I kind of, so that's why it's called portrait of sub and not a self portrait is that I was painting my, 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 my gnome de plume. I love it. Have you okay. done? You've done. You've done a lot of self portraits. Yeah. You, Me? You. Yeah. I used to. I think I was in a group show that Sean Cheatham um, did. Sean. And an then awesome I realized I, I felt so douchey painting myself. And then I realized. <laughs> oh. No, but then I realized, like you know what? It's it's a painting that's some special in in time and represents my yeah. life. And then also, like, I don't care about messing myself up or changing you know what i mean as much absolutely as i sometimes it's, still it's on it's, about the modern model thinks or at least well, I you're you're a being lot. honest and yeah. i think there's a there's a thing where a lot of times when i'm painting people i'm trying to make them like their best self right right i'm okay with making like putting all the the weirdness of myself in there it's it's an ex it's an ex it's a it's a study and and these like honesty yeah. Well, so they say I think I mean, explore exploration. I mean, that's what we're doing when we're painting, exploring ourselves, exploring, like learning about the rhino, like exploring your yeah. imagination, everything. So self I would is probably good for us. I would suggest anybody who's interested in self-portraits conceptually is to read anything on Rembrandt. Because yeah. Rembrandt yeah. is, um, he did so many self-portraits and you can see humanity in his eyes. You can see pain. You mm -hmm. could see happiness. And like, if you just go through Rembrandt self-portraits, it is, it is a master class of emotion painting and maybe one of the best artists who ever walked the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. So that's a great way. I mean, that's where, when you look in the eyes, it's like, where's the art? It's like, look in the eyes. There's a, you know, there's a book called Rembrandt's eyes. Look in the eyes of a Rembrandt paint self-portrait and tell me that there isn't the most 
honest emotion you've ever seen in all of painting. So, so yeah, Rembrandt self-portraits are incredible. It's a good challenge. Now you make me want to try one. Do it. I'd love to see. I would too. I'll just show you guys. Nobody else. Okay. And the deal. Yeah. <laughs> deal. I'd love that. Yeah. Everyone's saying they this is awesome, awesome talent. I like it, yeah. Uh, Greg, There's so much to talk about, and we're like, it's like, I right, know. You only we only have a tiny online. bit of time, tiny bit of time. Um, hey, Greg, did you do the album cover for Suburban's new album, Hive? My daughter wants to know. Not me. This is from Ron Pierce. Uh, no, I, okay. don't, I didn't. <laughs> Okay, here's also for either of you, but it's about acrylic paint. Can you use a pouring acrylic paint in place of a higher flow acrylic paint for doing line work, for example, and for its coverage? I'm not sure. A pouring acrylic? All I use is-, is Like a high flow acrylic or something, like a thinned out acrylic. Oh, like high viscosity? I'm thinking. Kind of yeah maybe but all i would say is try it like like anything else like whenever people ask me painting techniques a lot of times i was like why don't you just go sit down and try it because you're yeah. going to find out pretty quickly and that's what i had to do to figure out everything like like every day i'm figuring something new out and it's like by making mistakes and just going oh what the hell i'm just going to try it and it either works or it doesn't work so i don't I, know i would i would guess um as long on a chemistry level as long as there's a chemical bond between yeah. the acrylic uh, that's on top of the acrylic, it should be more than fine. Yeah, uh, acrylic acrylic will go is through. relatively op open that it probably right. will take take it. The only the thing I wouldn't do is you never paint acrylic on top of oil. Exactly, right. that doesn't work. Yeah. But you can paint right. acrylic on top of acrylic. I think until the cows come home. Right. Relative. I'm sure I there's a couple of chemicals. It is plastic. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And you it's, could it's plastic. And I was like, if I'm a lot of times I'll put a coat of matte medium over whatever surface, especially if I use a lot of gloss paints, I'll put matte medium over it and just start painting again. And everything flows like butter. Yeah. Matte medium is great. I actually put that, um, I use, uh, well, it's not matte medium, but when I seal, when I'm preparing my own canvases Yeah. and actually the, I've talked to Courtney about this when they were, you know, making can, uh, uh, panels and stuff is that you can, um, what you want to do is you want to like, if you're using uh, high density fiberboard H, you know, or any wood like yeah. panels, you, uh, you can put a matte medium or you put something, uh, uh, uh golden. Yeah. PVA sizing or yeah. golden's make something called GAC. GAC. Yeah. I have some right yeah. here. Yeah. yeah I, and that's, that's what, what, so what you're doing is you're just sealing the wood for yep. any impurities that won't come out. That's right. So you sealing that and it's, it's, I mean, generally it's acrylic. You know, matte medium can do the same. And what you're doing is you're sealing it. And then you can paint oil on top of that. And, yep. um, or you do, well, you do is you do your, your gesso, either traditional gesso or acrylic polymer gesso. Yep. And, um, and that's fine. But like, if you're doing that, I wouldn't put, if you're doing oil paint, I wouldn't do that. But an isolation layer that you're talking about. Yeah. If you do that, like you could just like back to the original question, you could just you can just keep on going on top of that. You know, the only thing I would say is allow enough time for proper drying right. and then you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Tony, you had a, like a lot of process questions. So I guess your overall process start to finish and then how long do paintings take estimation? <laughs> Depends obviously on that big one. I spent about two years on that one, but um, you know, when you, when, I still like to do my, my drawings first. And then I, you know, to figure it out, transfer my drawings, either using an oil transfer or a graphite transfer, mm -hmm. then I'll either uh, ink it or uh, fix it with like a fixative. But I tried not to mix too many chemicals in any of my paintings. I back to that sort of making it very solid and archivally sound, but you could, if you use like a, um, a workable matte fixative, um, the, the, the resin in it, It'll be, I mean, you can read 19th century manuscripts and they used their version of it, but they just, instead of using an aerosol, they, they blew it on. They were like, they had these little straws and they, and they just blow resin on it to seal wow. the drawing. But anyway, I would seal my drawing and then I do my underpainting and then I usually work in layers. I'll use one, mm -hmm. two, three, four layers. That said, I've spent a lot of time drawing and uh, I, you know, one of the advice I 
I give the people is like, if there's ever anything advice wise, it's like, just draw more. Yeah. Like I know we, even if they have painting advice, I'm like, just draw, draw as much as you can. Cause that's the thing. So there's a fair amount of a la prima painting, which means I just dip my, you know, blank canvas, dip it in thinned out paint and just start blocking in the shapes and stuff like that. And then you just work it like that. And I do a lot of that with, with some of my and then many still of those ice. layers are like scumbling and glazing. Yeah. So what I'll end up doing is those layers, like that first layer, even my eboche that I was talking about, which is that colored underpainting or the wipeout or the brown sort of sepia. Sometimes I do um, uh, um, gray, a gray underpainting because I have I pre-mix my colors. So I have several pre-mixed colors that I always use. So I'll do like a gray underpainting and then I'll start. But even in my head, I think of that as an underpainting and not my first layer. And in a way, psychologically, it makes me not nervous to go over it. So even my first layer, I'm like, oh, this is my first layer. So in a way it sort of takes the pressure off my myself. Mm -hmm. So I'll go, I'll paint in layers pretty opaquely to sort of like sculpt. What I'm trying to do is sculpt in the beginning. And then once I feel like I got the overall sculpture, the, the, the value structure of it, later, later layers, I'll do some glazing and scumbling and scumbling would be just pretty much putting a, a veil, like a dry brush, dry brush, uh, a dry brush over a, a dry area or glaze is when you do the same thing, but you add a little bit more medium to it. And it kind of gives it this like a uh, glossy effect. And you can do several layers of that and you can get this incredible um, uh, feeling of like, like you could see through it, like layers, it looks rich and deep. And, 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 and honestly, I do that, do that really, just to get to the point where I can then um, focus in on that last layer and just tweak details and then sort of sit there and just do as, as much or as little details, hopefully I, um, whatever the painting calls for. In a, in a way, just to sort of finish this up is a lot of people are like, oh, you do super detailed paintings. And I'm like, not necessarily, I do. That's not my goal. My goal is to make something that's in my head and put it on the canvas. It happens to be that that's where it goes. So I don't consider myself like a really detailed painter. That's just the result of my exploration. It just means that I'm going and going and just trying to figure this thing out. I, my intent isn't to do a super detailed painting. I know that sounds weird considering some of my paintings, but I'm like, it's not my goal. My goal is to get this thing out of my head and it just happens to be that that's the way it kind of looks right to me. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Are there areas of like thick and thin in your paintings? Cause they look so even, or do you try to keep it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I really actually, if anything, I wanted, there are times when I've gone in there being like, I'm totally gonna like blast this thing out thick and this area is super thin and I do it and I come back the next day and it all equals out. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> do that but some <laughs> weird way like my paintings like even out more than i want um i think using certain mediums that give you a more of a impasto and stuff can help yeah. and i do a little bit but I, i'd like to i the ever the times i've pushed it i've always loved the results mm -hmm. and i some of the work i love a lot like i love natalia i love how you handle your paint and i look at other people's paintings and i'm like oh man, I got to do some of that. You know, like, look how they like the, the paint looks like it looks like paint. It looks like it's singing, you know, it's like, it's thick and, I, and I do do it. about yours. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do like to play with, um, with texture because I do, I, I, I feel like you should see art in person. Yeah, I'm a little weirded out by like the computer and the, and yeah. I know we're all on Instagram and we all do it and it's fine. And I, I've, I've, I've seen so much stuff I would never come across because of places like Instagram and all that, which is great. But I've also seen things that look amazing on Instagram and you see them in real life. I'm like, Ooh, that doesn't look so good. So <laughs> I, I, I paint for it to be seen in person. So yeah. sometimes you don't get that in, in, a, in a photo. And I don't think my paintings necessarily look that good in photographs. I think they look much better in person because that's what they were the painting. Mine. And so yeah. both of yours would be a great best to see in person. And even Greg, your, the scale of yours. I know. Um, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> we're grateful for Instagram and internet. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited that I could see so much stuff. But I do think that everybody should go out and see 
real art in person with your eyes and not yeah. through the screen. Yeah. You know, like if you, Greg, you're, you have a show up right. Is your show still yeah. up? Yeah. It's up right now. It's go outside. It's at KP project gallery in Los Angeles. And it's up until the 4th of June. I'll post the details. So yeah, it's up right now in LA. Yeah, you need to see everybody. this. Like go, if you're in LA, go out and see art. My, see my largest, most project. complicated painting I've done to date is up in it. So if anybody wants to see it. Oh, yes. And then it's going home to Australia. Wow. Okay. I'm posting your, the details. Oh, and Greg, a uh, question from Larry Waybright. Okay. Um, when you start blending, are you approaching with speed while being light-handed or are you going super slow and light as a feather? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I really don't know. I can't. That's a hard question to answer. I'm not, I don't think about it. I really see I'm when people ask me ever to teach a class or something, I'm, I'm always in the going, I don't know, I'll just do it because I seriously, I don't think about the process while I'm doing it. All right, all right, put it down, take a, either a damp brush, blend it. I'm not thinking how much pressure I'm putting down or, or how much, I, I'm just painting it. I, I guess I'm better suited just painting and less teaching when people <laughs> ask me. But I do do, set, the seminars I do, it's basically me just sitting there painting. All right, everybody watch. I'm going to do this next thing. I'm going to do this next thing. And I'll, we'll tell stories and stuff during the seminars. They always turn out great and people learn stuff. But I couldn't answer that question with like, well, I've used about this much pressure. And then it's not a bad question to but be it's honest. It's super intuitive, right? I'm sure yeah. both, both of you painting so long and often. Um, I didn't know how to answer questions like this until I started teaching. I never knew yeah. what I did because I just yeah. did it. Yeah, I'm usually thinking about, oh man, uh, what are the kids doing? Do I have to leave to go pick them up for school? Or man, I, I want to make dinner tonight, chef shrimp. That sounds good. And my head's just going in all different places. I'm not thinking about, I. And I, maybe there's a little bit of ADD in me too that gets channeled into the painting. And I just have this big storm going on in my head every time I'm painting or drawing or just all day. I don't know. I'm weird. I think, I think you said it exactly. When I started teaching, it really changed a lot in communication. Because again, I think we're all, as artists, I think we all of us have a little bit of that sort of introvert type of thing. And when it was like forced to be like the certain things I just kind of knew how to do because I don't know. I just, I don't know. I just, uh, just I had to like, it, I was too insecure to be like, I can't just say that. It'll make me look like an idiot. So right. I had to like figure out why. Mm -hmm. And I think teaching, teaching made me so much better, like as an artist, because it really forced me to, 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 to figure stuff out, to try to communicate it. So um, yeah, I get it. You know, it's like, sometimes you're just like, I, I don't know. You just kind of do it. <laughs> you just kind of do this thing and it works. Uh, hey, do you mind if I ask a question that I just saw up on the chat? I didn't realize the chat was on this side. Uh, to both of you, is it difficult to part with your paintings from, from Sandra? Oh, uh, you, if it's, yeah, sometimes they're my babies, especially if it's of my daughter or something special and meaningful. I've been gotten better, but it, it can be. I always, I feel the second I get my good high-res photograph, like I, I go get, I, I get a giant scan. I, I just get the highest quality scan I can. And I know I'm going to put in a book or a magazine or make prints of it. I'm just as happy to have a book full of my paintings. I love putting books out. I think I, I have about six books. Wow. If I, I count the, the stop motion movie book that we did. And it just, I get so stoked seeing my stuff in a book. That's where I'm, happiest to have the collection and books and stuff that because people can buy a print they have that one but you buy a book and you just got hundreds of, you're usually like 300 page books i put out and you got pages of art in it and i'm like that's where i get stoked so i can part with the piece knowing it's going into a book and it's going to be able to be seen by tons of people and they get in share enjoy it and i get a look at it whenever i want to it's like having a photo album I'm like oh i remember that you know but i don't have room for the paintings so i have to they have to I have to part with them yeah. You know, it's funny is that it almost goes back to what caused you to start doing this in the first place. You, you know, it's, you know, you were talking about books and all the books that you were looking at as a kid. And in a weird way, you're creating those for yourself. Yeah. You're doing these amazing paintings, but then you're getting to collect it and look at it in the same, in this sort of same spirit as. You know, yeah. I'm doing paintings. How this started. Books too. Yeah. I did start in books and you notice that a lot of the paintings I do, they have books in it that have portals into those worlds. Like you could fall into them. 
so yeah, books, yeah, I guess it does hold a, a lot, a big thing in my, my work. I love that. And knowing it, I think sometimes for me also knowing it's going to go to a good home, especially if I meet the collectors that feels yes. really good. Absolutely. I know for me that, um, I, I learned to kind of look forward to them going somewhere. Like even if I've worked months on this painting or something yep. and it gets bought, like you were saying, by a good collector, mm -hmm. it makes me really proud that to know that somebody is willing, and I don't know if this is like the self-deprecation thing, but that somebody would be willing to buy my work, you know, to say that in a way it was like, I'm honored. Like I'm yeah. really honored that you care so much that you would actually buy this painting with your hard earned money that I worked really hard on. And in a way I saw, I saw that as this, like in a per, let me say this in a perfect world, if I didn't have to, like, we didn't have bills and all that to pay. Like I would give my paintings to my friends yeah. or the people who really appreciate it in a perfect world, a because perfect, I want yeah. the people to, to appreciate them. Yep. So for me, and honestly, like, and then when I started thinking about it, when I started thinking about it in a logical way, I was like, I do this thing and I'm really proud of it. Even if it's not my best painting, I'm proud of it because I worked on it and it's the best I could do at that time. You know, does it mean I, that's the best I can do? No, not at all. At that time, it was like, it's what it was, what it was. And then it goes off and it goes into somebody's home and then they love it, hopefully. And I get a check and it allows me to do the next painting that I can revisit this idea of the process that I'm trying to figure out and trying to perfect or trying to search. It allows me to search. And I don't know, there's this weird sort of relationship with that that I'm start, I'm become comfortable with. And I think a lot of it is just that if it goes somewhere and it's kind of loved, I'm like, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. like, push it, go. Go, go, go to where it needs to go. And I, and I think I'm okay with that. Awesome. And inspires you to make more. Right. Okay. We have one minute left, you guys. Um, ah! I know. Well, we should probably talk, uh, thank Trakel and maybe thank mention you, your favorite products or what we recommend or what we use, maybe what you I use the golden tack lawn brushes. They're my favorite. So that's, I definitely love all of them. Um, Philbert's rounds, but I really like the dagger brushes, which we came up with together. And you could do all kinds of fun tricks with them. Do you guys ever use brushes when you're like painting walls? Stupid question. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. I'll, I'll, recently, I'll yeah. Yeah, more oh, recently, not before, but now I will. But gosh, like, oh, some or a little more highlights in there. So yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm loving the um, the crimson the crimson tacklons that I helped develop with with. Trekel, I was looking for a perfect brush that was like really gave me uh, that spring mm -hmm. back. I wanted it to be synthetic because save the animals. Thank you. Uh, but but I uh, wanted it to be synthetic that uh, I cared a lot about that, but I think it holds its shape really. And I wanted something that kind of holds its shape. I like, I generally use filberts and rounds. Mm -hmm. And what I do sometimes with rounds, let me show you something I do. Uh, even though I use filberts uh, and I would have, uh, demoed this, but I use a lot of rounds too. If you could see this, as I'm, I do a lot more pressure sensitive. So if I if I take a, a black paint, just go extreme, and I press really hard, it'll be black. But if I take black paint and I press really hard and then ease up on my pressure, I can almost do it so it's like a middle value blue blue gray. Oh. So with my and I do that with all my brushes. And I start off with crimson tacklons. I end up and I finish off with my gold, the golden tacklons. I think that's a, for me a perfect combination. Crimson tacklons for most of the painting, like for like the heavy duty stuff, and then golden tacklons to sort of bring everything together. But what I do is a lot of times is like I'll swirl, I'll swirl my round, um, and then when there's paint on this, if I push down on my palette, it almost becomes like a filbert. It kind of does that. Yep. And then I can sort of like, it almost becomes just like mini fan brush and I can like really do incredible amount of subtlety without doing anything fancy. It's just how hard and how soft you, you push on the brush. But generally speaking, generally, uh, um, filberts rounds are my choice with the, uh, with the, uh, crimson tacklons and the, uh, golden tacklons. I love I just that combo combination. Oh, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the liner, the new liner brushes, the, 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 the protege, not the protege, the, uh, yeah, the proteges. Yeah. Um, 
those are incredible for detail. I mean, they, they go to a tiny, tiny, tiny point. Those are pretty amazing. All different sizes. <laughs> <laughs> and you get some brush cleaner while you're at it. So treat your brush yeah. as well. Get some, put that little that coconut oil yes. on it at the end. And when you wash them, yeah, coconut soap. Place them you. down like this. Don't do this. Right. While they're drying, push them to, uh, like this. This is how you let them dry flat. Let yeah. them dry you, flat. Yeah. And the restorer is amazing. Yeah. yeah the restorer is good. Yeah. So Tony, you know, do you reshape yours or you just like, you lay them, you yeah. wash them and lay them flat? Yeah. I'll go like this. I'll like, I'll do this, yeah. squeeze out the water. Yeah. And then I'll put a little bit of the restorer on it, do that, lay them flat. And then, you know, when you buy a new brush and it's hard. That's why you break you break that. That's what the restore does. It's sort of it almost creates that that first look. And if you take care of your brushes, they'll last a long time. Yeah. Like, you know, I try one thing I try to do actually is um, if I know I'm going to paint every day for the week, I don't wash my brushes every day. Mm -hmm. What I'll do is I'll take some safflower oil or some poppy oil. And after I clean my brushes and like a little bit of uh, mineral spirits, I'll dip it in uh, safflower oil or poppy oil, squeeze it out and just leave it. By tomorrow, it'll still be wet. It'll be fine. So I try to clean my brushes maybe once, once a week. Yeah. As long as you know it's the same brush you're going to use next day, you can clean it, put it either, put the tip in oil, leave it in there, or just like put in safflower again, this is oil painting. I'm sorry. Or poppy oil, yeah. put that shape it, leave it. If you're going to use it tomorrow, you'll, you're, mm -hmm. you're good to go. They'll be fine. So try not to overwash, wash them too much. Right. Awesome tip. I just like you, thank you with so them. much, Greg. I love both of you guys. I, oh, I'm, you too, so, I'm yeah. really honored not only to be friends with you, but to be able to see your paintings. Uh, you, you know, I, 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 let me say this. I think art matters. I think we should make more art. You know, there should be more art in this world and, uh, you know, go out there and make some, because, uh, not only am I, uh, I am an artist, but I'm a huge fan of art. So I love, I love to see art out there and I really admire both your work so much. Yeah. I, I just echo that. You guys are both awesome. Glad, I'm glad we we're able to do this. Thank you, Courtney and Trakel for, bringing us together to have this little chit chat. It's super fun. And there yeah. should be more Great. shop talks. Thank yeah. you, Calda. You guys are amazing. Yes. It's so cool. Your work is so different, but so similar and same influences. And then your graffiti, it's just like magic. And then you guys have such a strong studio practice. You're just, you're yeah. so inspirational. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys. Thank you, Natalia. So, thank you, Trick Greg, since I have you on the line, next time I'm in LA, you down to paint a wall? Yeah, we have to. Been I talking about it for watch. years. <laughs> I know, but stay tuned. Uh, uh, I actually, I'm going to probably make a. Uh, uh, um, I'm going to make some time out soon to come out to LA. So All right, let's do it. We have to, have to, have to, have to. Yay! Okay. Oh, and you got everyone. Um, pay attention to um, Trakel's page and everything for upcoming Zoom demos and webinars. I'm sad we missed a demo from Tony. That would have been so cool to see. We'll do another, I'll do one soon. I have all the like camera stuff. So now I can do it here and not have to like travel. Awesome. Greg, do you want to give your home address in case you want any letters from anyone? Oh, <laughs> sure. Okay. I live in, where do you live, Tony? <laughs> no, no more of those. Yeah, yeah that's weird stuff. Yeah. Go see Greg's show. Yeah, and everybody. Natalia, please uh, let us let us know, um, you know, when, when you're... When, if yeah. you're going to be showing or anything, I soon. will. I know. I need. I same thing as you. Commissions, and then I'm. I'm. Doing and then I'm. I'm new free. Stuff. Yes. Free. Yes. So I look forward to seeing all that stuff. Thank um, you. Thank you. You're beautiful. Take care of each other. You're all amazing. Yay. Bye guys. Bye guys. Thank you Bye, everybody for tuning. Thank you everybody. Awesome. Are we still recording? <laughs>